The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario is all in on sports betting. And with billions in wagers and millions in revenue already, the advertising battle for your bucks is fierce. But is it already undermining the love of the game? We'll debate that tonight. Then, author Carolyn Weitzman is here on the curious case of Clara Ford, a Parkdale murder, and race and feminism in 19th century Toronto. It's Wednesday, February 15th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. Watch any Maple Leafs game or Blue Jays game or football of any kind, and the one thing you will see for sure, ads inviting you to bet. And it's not just to bet on the outcome of whatever contest you're interested in. It's really nitty-gritty stuff, sometimes having nothing to do with the game. People bet millions on the color of the Gatorade that would be dumped on the coach of the winning Super Bowl team. It was purple, incidentally. It's sometimes funny, Often annoying, but it's also very big business and potentially big trouble. With us now for more, in the nation's capital, Brian Massey, the NDP member for Windsor West. In Windsor, Ontario, Chelsea Rodriguez, problem gambling counselor at Hotel Dieu Grace Healthcare. And here in our studio, Paul Burns, president and CEO of the Canadian Gaming Association, and Deirdre Querney, registered social worker with the city of Hamilton's Alcohol, Drug and Gambling Services and co-creator of... Brain Connections. That's a project to share information about gambling and the brain, and we are delighted to have you two here in our studio. Brian and Chelsea, uh, thanks for joining us tonight here on TVO. I just want to start by putting some facts on the record here. According to Ipsos uh, and their polling organization, 47% of adults in Ontario say they have done some form of online gambling in the past year, almost half. 35% have played online casino games. 30% of Ontarians have tried sports betting. That compares to 22% of all Canadians, so we're a little bit above the national average. Um, okay, the feds lifted the ban on single-game sports betting in the summer of 2021. Ontario began regulating in April of 2022, so we're almost a year later, and I guess I want to find out off the st just off the top here, how do you think it's going? Paul, how do you think it's going? Well, I think it's for customers, obviously, there's a lot of choice right now. Um, but the two things that coincided was the change in the federal law to permit single event sports betting, a product that Canadians were seeking through offshore online sites to the tune of billions of dollars for years. Um, and then the province of Ontario deciding to create a regulated marketplace for all online gaming. And those two things came together with the launch of the Ontario regulated marketplace in April. Uh, sports betting started to be offered in the, in the fall uh, of 21. So what we see now for, for customers in Ontario in particular is a lot of choice. Um, and, but a regulated marketplace that comes with understanding there's fairness for customer. People were gambling insights that weren't regulated, didn't know where they were. So now it's regulated. Now it's regulated, it's within the, the, the standards set by the province of Ontario. Um, the province wanted to make to what was called the gray market for many years mm -hmm. because the law in Canada is a bit unsettled in terms of whether the activities of offshore gaming sites that were accessing Canadians was truly illegal or not. And, it's, and so Ontario decided to take action. Well, the idea say, being the money stays here. Money stays here, consumer protection was really at the forefront of what they were doing in terms of some of the standards they've set uh, for um, KYC for signing up and, and verifying know, customer. Know your client. Know your customer. Right. Uh, verifying who they are, where they are, that they're in the province, that they have proper ID and, and uh, adhering to anti-money laundering, okay, to the I responsible so. gaming standards. All of those things are now put in place. So, But for customers, a lot more choice. Let's Chelsea, go. what's your take on it? Well, of course, you know, this has been legalized and we were seeing clients with issues with uh, online gaming much before it was legalized. So uh, for us, especially with the pandemic, there was a, a shift once the casinos closed. Many of our clients did turn to online gaming. Brian Massey, what say you? Well, it's a good start with regards to getting the black market uh, and competing against the nefarious operations that have no regulation 
I'm a little concerned about the intensification of advertising that took place. Uh, and that was somewhat expected to a certain degree because you have a lot of market forces that are going for customer base right now. So you've seen a really aggressive, in my opinion, um, advertising campaigns because once you get somebody in your customer base, it's easier to keep one than to win one over. So um, those are the challenges that I think that we see in the forefront right now. But it's definitely better than it going to organize crime and uh, making sure that we're actually going to have uh, some issues that we can have control over. Okay, Deirdre, your view. Well, I agree with Chelsea and Brian. Basically, what I've seen, and this is just anecdotally because we don't have the research yet, um, but there has been a shift from the brick and mortar casino being the main problem, usually slot machines, to what we have now, which is just about every caller we have at Alcohol, Drug and Gambling Services who has a gambling problem is saying online gambling is the issue. That's a huge change in the landscape for us. And the other thing is people are talking a lot about how triggering that advertising is that Brian was talking about. Triggering meaning what? Meaning. You can't watch a game without seeing gambling. When you have a gambling addiction, and this you'll see on brainconnections.ca, when you have a gambling addiction, you, your sensitivity to the gambling cues is much heightened. So I might not notice it, you might not notice it, but someone who has an addiction will be you know, honed in on those ads. And so, or on social media or wherever they're going, radio commercials, the intensification of the advertising is having an effect on people who have an addiction. So it's really, really hard for them to just sit back and watch a game with their families and not have that in their face. Paul, what's the industry doing about that? Well, the industry is, is it's a, in many cases, it's actually a shared partnership when it comes to sports broadcasting and gambling advertising and sports broadcast. The leagues have policies about how they want to see their broadcasts portrayed. Um, limiting ads, in some cases, the NFL has a very specific policy about how many ads. The broadcasters here in Canada have, have, in, have undertaken to limit share of voice. And actually, the statistics show that, that you're not seeing any more gambling ads in you know, uh, sports broadcasts than you were seeing for automotive company or financial services. In fact, the statistics show that there's actually less gambling advertising than those. Um, but it's new. And that's part of what we haven't seen a lot of gambling. The only gambling advertiser in the province of Ontario was the Ontario Lottery Gaming Corporation. They still are, but so there's a newness to this as well. The companies, clearly because of the regulatory standards that come behind the rules here, are required to provide tools and education to players, so how they can control their spend, their time, but also actively monitoring player behavior so that they can actually see players that are exhibiting signs where there's, they've been a, a consistent $25 a week sports better and all of a sudden the amount of money goes up or the number of bets go up, that they will actually activate and, and talk to that customer. Okay. One thing though, there, there, there's, there's no organization called Truck Buyers Anonymous because people have a compulsion to buy trucks. There is Gamblers Anonymous because people have a compulsion to gamble. So is the analogy about the number of commercials in a football game really relevant? I mean, it's it's the newness to it. So advertising is part of promoting a regulated marketplace because we knew there was a close to a billion dollars in profits leaving the province every year to offshore sites that were advertising on social media platforms. Some were advertising play for free sites on on television. So now what we we've now been able to, I think there's limiting the choices for for Ontarians, believe it or not, through this. Uh, but also at the same time, we operators are are proactively promoting the tools for players to manage. Advertising has become part of that regulated marketplace. And okay, with let me that, get Brian on let me get Brian on that. Do you think there is adequate attention by the gaming association, by the industry itself, to ensure that there are not a plethora of ads on the air and that they do remind you to gamble responsibly? Yeah, well, the Gaming Association has been clear on this um, before, but I think it's up to us as a regulator under the Canadian Broadcasting Act and as well. It was one of the weaknesses of the legislation was that we just basically devolved it to the province, and we knew that from the get-go. Uh, it's still a better situation um, that we've had in the past. Um, you know, so the Ontario Lottery Gaming Commission, they do have all those checks and balances that Paul mentions. Uh, when you sign in, you actually have to be in the country or the province as well, too. Um, but what I'm concerned about is during the game itself, the heightened experience of trying to affect a person's behavior just to watch that event. And I think that's a little bit different than, you know, another commercial. Um, this is an ongoing experience. And what I'm worried about right now 
is that we should be walking, um, not running towards uh, this experience. And so I'd like to see, and some leagues have been great in terms of uh, less of a reaction. The NHL, for example, is very aggressive on this. Um, they're even using current athletes, which I think are compromised individuals uh, to promote um, events. Whereas others have kind of, you know, stayed back and played it a little bit more um, uh, related to the, you know, I guess their traditions of, of not being as influencers during the game. And that's what I, I'm concerned about. Chelsea, can I get you to comment on the advertising? Because I know that probably most of us have seen those ads with Wayne Gretzky and um, and Connor McDavid, which are, frankly, I mean, they're good ads. They're quite funny. They certainly let you know what the product is. Uh, but I guess there's a question of whether or not the saturation amount is too much and what you think of them. Well, I think that by including celebrities, it creates this normalization of the gambling behavior as this is part and parcel to the sports watching experience now, for example. And we know that when activities such as gambling um, are more accessible and the exposure goes up and therefore they're more normalized, there you may see an increase of problematic gambling behaviors. So I can speak for our organization that many of our clients will use the terms, you know, this, it's inescapable, right? I, I can't look anywhere. I can't go anywhere without being triggered. And when I say being triggered, that means triggering the strong urge to gamble. So it's very tough out there for some of our clients to maintain their sobriety in this particular climate. I understand that, but then let me do this follow-up. What percentage of people would you be talking about who are watching a game who might be triggered by seeing an ad? I wouldn't have that data necessarily. I don't think anybody has that data per se because this is so new. I can just speak to the majority of our sports gamblers that we see here at Problem Gambling at uh, Hotel Du Grace Healthcare that uh, we, we speak about high risk situations when we're trying to work out a recovery plan. And we say, you know, try to avoid these external triggers as best you can. And with this increase in ads, it is becoming a little more difficult to do that naturally because it is almost everywhere that they, that they look at this point. Well, let me take that up with Deirdre then. If if you've got, let's say, 5 or 10% of the people watching any particular game who have a problem being triggered, are we really saying that we should be canceling all advertising if 90% are doing it, 95% are doing it just fine? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it, it's interesting that we're talking about this because in the United States, the, um, the ICRG, the International Council on Responsible Gambling, has put out a call for a center for excellence on studying advertising and gambling mm -hmm. to find out for sure what is the impact, right? We don't know. Right? We don't. No. You don't and have numbers either. We, it, we, have, we do not. Mm -hmm. And so all we have, Chelsea and myself, is this anecdotal evidence that it's different, that it's changed, that it feels oppressive, that it feels like you can't just do your normal activities without this inundation of ads. And so, uh, you know, my hope is that Ontario will also follow suit and do these kinds of studies. It's really mm -hmm. important to know what exactly is happening with people before we make decisions about what to do. Paul. Yeah. No, and that's exactly right. And Flutter International, which is a company, the parent company of FanDuel and PokerStars, is actually with the Responsible Gaming Council here in Canada, is funding a study to look at advertising because we do want to learn. There is a news. That's really what the new part is. The gambling activities have been accessible to Ontarians mm -hmm. uh, before and after all of this. They've because the internet was there and available to anybody who wanted to use it without many of the controls that are now in place. Do you have a sense about what percentage of people have a problem with gambling who are watching these games? I, not watching the games, but we know in the population that the, the rates of severe problem gambling can, depending on jurisdiction, range from a half percent to one and a half percent. And then there's others that have control problems that may be episodic mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, and, and there is an understanding of that player, but what is advertising? And we, because we have had, as we said, we've had the gaming advertising. Do we have more? Yes. But it's, you know, in terms of, because it's different. And the activity is, is now creating these companies legal and regulated. With that comes the ability to provide advertising. I think what everybody is learning from this, broadcasters, as they look at what the content is in their broadcasts, are evaluating those things as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why I talk about a shared responsibility, because... The NHL and Major League Baseball, uh, in their collective agreements, allow their players to be brand ambassadors. In fact, the NHL's decision predated North American online gaming was actually their European-based players who would do it in their home countries. Okay, let me so, get this from Brian then. Do you think there needs to be a crackdown, Brian, in the use of professional athletes, either retired or current, in the advertising of gambling options during games? I, I think the current... Um 
ones that are playing or if you're coaching or you're involved and there's a you hope it's like a conflict of interest where you have i guess some type of connection to the outcome uh, would be a responsible way to to do things to start with i'm less concerned about the previous ones that are just associated from um, that lifestyle now but the ones that are currently uh, doing that it's very difficult to watch um, i'm a hockey coach myself or i used to be um, until recently and uh, i don't want um, you know a celebrity to come on and you know watching your, your game with your family and celebrity says to bet on me i mean it just doesn't wash with me i think that we could just slow it down um, and do the responsible thing here and i'm I'm confident that if we can do the proper research um, and we work on this together, that we could actually build a better system. But what we had before was was just outrageous. I mean, we were literally letting organized crime and the gray and nefarious businesses run our lives with this. And so now we have control over some of the information, which should be the process. And right now, I'd like to see them put the brakes on the current athletes because uh, it just seems doesn't pass the smell test to me. Well, there is, Chelsea, there is precedent for this. Apparently, uh, the United Kingdom legalized sports betting and then made a decision to ban celebrities that appeal directly to children as well as sports stars. They can't appear in gambling advertisements. Do you think we need to do that in Canada? You know, I'm not the one to make the judgment call on that, Steve. However, I will say that it would be nice to see that if there's going to be this increase in advertisement, that there's also an increase in the uh, acknowledgement that there are services like ours that are free services that cater to people who are on the gambling spectrum and even loved ones. Because oftentimes loved ones spot an issue before the person gambling themselves do. So I think that it would be, I'm always going to advocate for more supports and more awareness because there are still people who come to the center and we cater to the entire province that say we had no idea help existed. We didn't know that there was a possibility to gain this support and these tools. So of course, I'm, I'm not one to say on how people should or shouldn't advertise or endorse. I will just say that I can only speak from my experience with my clients that uh, we would love to see a little bit more of some, uh, some safeguards in place for this. Deirdre, would this be a reasonable safeguard in your view, banning <laughs> athletes from appearing in these ads? Well, I'll, I'll answer it this way. Um, I think this question speaks to, again, the need for research to guide what we're doing. So if England made that decision, it would be interesting to see what, what, what prompted that, what did they know, and what can we do similar research. I will say again, anecdotally, um, I was at a, a, a little webinar with um, featuring different ethnocultural uh, problem gambling counselors working with different um, marginalized populations and one of the counselors was saying in the population that he works with um, stars actors are treated like gods right they, and sometimes they make temples for them <laughs> and one of them had become one of these advertisers for gambling and he noticed a huge increase in the number of people who were gambling because this actor was doing it so it, there there are so you know what you're saying before is there is no truckers anonymous this kind of advertising is different than other kinds of products right and we have to i think we have to be really careful what we're doing and let the research tell us what the next steps ought to be Brian, do you have a view on whether or not pro athletes ought to be disallowed from participating in these ads? Yeah, I, I don't think that they should. Um, and right now, again, I would call for the leagues that really lobbied for this. So ironically, it was the NHL that actually resisted this for the longest period of time. I, and and uh, Batman as well. Um, they weren't terribly uh, good to work with, to be quite frank. And now they're the most uh, aggressive in terms of trying to take uh, opportunity with this. In fact, they had their own online betting system uh, going on for years um, so I just like to say it take it down a notch uh, I do notice that there's been some better responsible gaming co commercials that have come out recently um, we have some wonderful resources in the province of Ontario because um, we already have some infrastructure to do with casinos and already lotteries and so forth so I'd like to see us concentrate on making sure those things are in proper place and then after that we can then consider that I think doing the research point is is critical I mean that's you know that's that's where we'll be best informed. So well, I just like to take it down a notch. Yeah, can't argue against research, but Paul, what does your gut tell you about whether or not this country ought to ban using pro athletes in gambling commercials? Well, I think what we've seen is that around the athletes, there's lots of rules and leagues have put around it in terms of what they do. It's a name and likeness uh, association and not encouraging betting, and there's a lot of a lot of rules around what the players can and can't do within those relationships they have with the companies. I agree. I think it's the time to, to look and see how uh, of uh, and the research is an important part of that in learning um, because one jurisdiction did it 
Uh, the UK, very different environment when it comes to betting. It's the biggest part of their gaming industry, where in Ontario particularly, the lottery is still the biggest product that's out there. So I think we all can learn and understand. And, and listen, from my conversations with broadcasters and leagues, they're interested to know too. They're not, they're, they take this responsibility seriously. They know they're party to uh, the betting industry now as part of their relationships. And everybody's trying to say, okay, how can we, we can look to be better? What can we do in terms of policies that they've put in place? Do they need to improve them? Uh, broadcasters and how their content is viewed on television. Everybody's looking at all of these things as we were mm -hmm. nine months, 10 months in, we've got some time under our belt and we're looking at what that, that is. And well, that's why it's, it's an ongoing conversation, to be frank. Yeah, sure, uh, which is why we're having yeah. it here tonight on TVO. Chelsea, I wonder if you could tell me whether in your personal experience, you find that since legalized gaming came to all the professional sports leagues and we're seeing it you know, during the course of games and on commercials and so on, uh, at the risk of putting this uh, in not a great way, is your business up since all this happened? So the thing is, Steve, I, I can't speak to specific figures, but I will say that um, in terms of a year ago, my caseload has grown. So let's put it that way. Many of our gamblers switched to online gaming. I'm sorry, online gambling during the pandemic. And uh, sports gambling has always been on the forefront of what we see a lot. And of course, yes, in the past, it was done on those uh, maybe in a more illegal sense or personal betting and things of that sort. But my caseload has grown. Deirdre, how about you? Uh, yes, I, I agree with Chelsea. The landscape has changed, that's for sure. And so, um, you know, people are calling more for this particular problem than they did before. Mm. And it's also concerning because you, when you think about vulnerable populations like youth, marginalized groups, um, you know, the kind of betting you can do now can, can be more damaging than maybe what was happening before because you could bet on multiple little things. Like you were saying in your introduction, you could bet on you know, the color of the Gatorade or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like there's mm -hmm. all, so many things, micro bets all the way through a game. Uh, that's different than before. So people can get into trouble more quickly. And this is what I'm hearing, again, anecdotally, waiting for that research to come out well, to confirm. Well, anecdotal, but, but what other explanation would there be if, it's, mm. if the caseload has got up in the past year mm. and things changed dramatically a year ago? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you have the answer? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, you know, that's just, that's my guess, right? Mm. That, that the landscape has changed. And, but the other thing that's happened is that the pandemic is a factor, right? So when the pandemic hit, I think some people just didn't think services were there. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, we continue to operate virtually the whole time, uh, but not everybody knew that, right? So um, people are coming out <laughs> again after the pandemic, emerging mm -hmm. um, with different kinds of problems. But, you know, like Chelsea said, it's so important that people know that help is there and it's free. Connects Ontario is the place to call. If you think you have a problem, really important that you get help so it doesn't get worse. Right. Let me read this from James Tanner. He is a, a guy who writes for the hockey fan site Editor and Leaf, and he writes the following. For the NHL, whose main audience is the children that idolize the players and romanticize the game, this is a completely disgusting, unnecessary, and inappropriate source of income considering most of their audience is made up of children. Yes, adults like hockey, but if you don't think that the NHL is for kids, you don't spend a lot of time with kids. Uh, Brian Massey, let me get you on this one. Um, are we doing an adequate job of keeping this stuff away from kids? Well, I, I don't think so. I think, again, that part of the weaknesses that we had and what we're trying to address, I think, right now is that we devolved this decision uh, because it was federal law to the provinces, and each province decides its own fate and its own structures in place and so forth. And I think that a, a good example of where we need to make sure there's normalization is that it's okay to go get help for um, sports gaming addiction. Uh, I think that's one of the changes that we're seeing now before it was sheltered and was done on your phone in your basement, your backyard with your bookie um, from all kinds of organized crime aspect. We, we had sensational cases in Toronto where they were, you know, they were using helicopters, guns, all kinds of different things were going on. And um, now, um, we, we normalize it, and at the same time, though, there's got to be some responsibility for not just the, um, you know, the, the the performers, but also the governments to educate and make sure people feel comfortable, and it's okay to get help. And if you're, you know, you're not at fault. It's the same thing. I've been working on a lot of anti-fraud stuff. It's the same thing. Is that we don't want people to feel shame from getting help. So to me, I think we just need to cool it a little bit right now, 
and, and transition into the market a little bit more strategically and also be able to address with, with some of this stuff. Um, we have also alcohol that's already, you know, advertised in front of kids. But again, it, it just, the NHL just looks like they're, again, just using this as an abusive uh, attempt right now, in my opinion. That's just my, that's just my opinion. It's very aggressive what they've done compared to the other leagues. Okay, Paul, let me get your view on whether or not you think the industry is doing an adequate job keeping this out of the hands of kids. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that you're seeing that because of the regulation that's been brought into place. So, what, uh, prior to Regulation Ontario, you could sign into a site and put money in, and they didn't ask you who you were, they didn't ask for any identification, they didn't ask, so children could actually gamble if that was the case because there were no controls. That's ended. Two, we are seeing um, uh, a lot of message around what can be advertised, how, because there's there's lots of rules being written from Think TV, who clears all the TV television ads that go on the air. They have a set of policies and standards. The Canadian Marketing Association is developing a further set of guidance. Mm -hmm. The gaming regulators have very clear rules and have forever about things that primarily appeal to minors, the images and likeness. Billboards can't be near facilities near schools or, or recreation centers that appeal to youth. There's lots of things written into the regulations to try and control these. Um, the ability f for um, operators not targeting minors in social media. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things as best as we can through those processes. All are part of the regulatory regime we have now in Ontario. So yes, I think there is a start to do that, that things are better than they were. And I think as an industry, we could, we know that people have control issues with our products. We understand that, mm -hmm. and it's go to great efforts to make sure that we can provide tools, information. Um, those connect one one eight hundred appear in every ad now that goes on television. That wasn't the case mm -hmm. six months ago. Now that there's it's it's people know. Did you do that, or were you forced to do that? No, that's part of the regulatory regime that Ontario did in bringing out the framework. Mm -hmm. Operators are happy to do it. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of also providing access and they train their staff let me to be bring, able to deal with people who have control issues. Yeah, Let me bring a, a, a new angle into this discussion here. And uh, Chelsea and Deirdre, I'm going to start with you first. Chelsea, have you ever done this? Have you ever gambled on a sporting event, either with one of these new services or using your smartphone or whatever? Personally, no. Deirdre, how about you? Sorry, no. Haven't done it. Mm -mm. Okay. Brian, have you done it? Yes, uh, the I use the Ontario Lottery Gaming thing, and I put a small bet on the Super Bowl uh, win loss, and I won, thank goodness. But twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. You bet the Chiefs, and did you have to give any points? Uh, I just bet the Chiefs outright. I, <laughs> I'm an NFL player, you know, fan, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing that we're looking for is casual involvement and enjoyment like that. But that's why, again, I I just think that um, that's a better situation than me going to one of the other private operators. I, quite frankly, didn't have a choice in it, but I wish the Ontario Lottery Gaming Commission and the casinos were the ones that were primary operators to start with right now. But that's up to the provinces, and so they have several different groups that are out there right now. Um, but I'm sticking with the public provider, because I know that also the investment goes back to our health care and other types of initiatives. Okay. Was it fun? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. It wasn't, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I stayed home and uh, had a friend come over to watch the Super Bowl. so. Uh, for me, it was just part of the experience. But I, you know, you can get into all these other um, things that you can bet on. But those have been out there for a long time, like you know the Gatorade. I mean, I think in Europe they actually bet on bet on even political um, races and a whole series of different mm -hmm. things that we would see as uh, outside of our normal system here. So uh, to me, it's part of the experience. But again, it's part of my entertainment. Um, but again, you know, this is the type of stuff that we have a change in and. And I think that it's important right now that we do this properly. Okay. Paul, do you bet? Yes. What do you bet on? Uh, I bet on NFL football. I bet on NHL hockey. Um, How do you do it? Um, if um, For many years, I always enjoyed going to Las Vegas because it's the only place you could bet in person. <laughs> well, those days uh, are Because gone. The, sports back, <laughs> the sports book environment is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of fun place to watch games because it's just exciting and there's a lot of people interested. Um, but I, uh, I bet through apps, um, hockey, I usually bet over-unders or winners, uh, who's going to win the game. So an over-under on total goals. Did you have a bet on the Super Bowl? Uh, I didn't bet on this one. You I'm, didn't bet no, on the Super Bowl? No. I'm a Bills fan. It was kind of disappointing. <laughs> I didn't have, there was no real motivation for me in this one, so nice I sat it see, out. Nice to see tomorrow on the field before the game, eh? Yes. Yeah, that was nice. 
Uh, okay. Can you explain to people who, I mean, I have to be honest, I've never done this, never never placed a bet on the phone, or I haven't, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, I just don't do it. What's the appeal? If for people, it's, it's, um, it's they love sport. So it's I love a, sports too, but I don't, I've never done an, it. It's a, so what an, am I missing? Uh, the sense of competition in some ways, and sense of um, um, uh, further engagement, enjoyment of, of uh, who get fans who get into the statistics and the details, who really you know are passionate about uh, their game, and, and seeing as a way to have some fun, more fun with the game, enjoy it with friends. Um, and some people do it. To, it's um, saying, hey, it's nice to win a few bucks to bet on a game. And uh, a lot of people, it is, um, it is casual. It is recreational for, um, they bet on their team. So they always just bet on their team because... Um, it's a way of supporting your team. It's a way to support the team. I don't yeah. want to, that's who I cheer for. That's what I'm going to... I have probably 10 bets on the Leafs winning the Stanley Cup this year from a lot of sports books that open because Seriously. I said... Yes. You want to talk about the advisability of that of those bets? That's why you know I, I, but I placed them because I'm a fan, and was, as the market opened, I, okay. that was my choice. And, and I, Brian, I wonder if part of the is part of the fun in placing the bet the ability to come on province-wide television after the game and say, "Look how smart I am." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would have bet more if I was smart, but I mean, it's, to me, it's part of the experience. So I'm also I joined a fantasy league for the first time with my friends. And so what I like about it is, um, you know, I like researching the game. I like to see, and I look for games that I can actually um, get the underdog and beat the odds, so to speak. So I do research on the players, on little, you know, it's like entertainment and it's um, fun to do that. And then I bet on it, like I, you know, I, I count the money lost. So if I lose the money, then that's okay. I'm not, then I'll go worry about it. And if I win, that's great. And so, that's my enjoyment experience as part of it. And it doesn't bother me if I lose because I don't go into the betting without knowing that, you know, I could lose it. And again, I love the research part of it. It's just fun. I mean, you have these experts and people with all kinds of different things going on and you can actually, you know, have fun trying to beat the odds in the system just for fun. Hmm. Uh, Deirdre, we've got about a minute left here. I mean, clearly the toothpaste is out of the tube on this. We are not going to outlaw sports gambling <laughs> yeah. in the province of Ontario uh, anymore. But if there were, you know, if there's one thing you'd like to see change, what would it be? Oh, one thing I'd like to see change, maybe not in the way that you're suggesting, but is a reduction of stigma around gambling addiction. Hmm. I would love it if people just acknowledge that this can happen to anyone. Um, and that if it is happening to you, it's important to get that help. Um, the services in Ontario are amazing for treatment, free, accessible, confidential. So, so to move the discussion away from the shameful secret of having a gambling addiction to, hey, it's a mental health issue, and it's important to get help as soon as you recognize that you have it. And it's out there. The help is, is there to it be is had. It's there. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to thank the four of you for coming into TVO tonight, sort of virtually and actually. Brian Massey, the New Democrat member for Windsor West. Chelsea Rodriguez, problem gambling counselor at Hotel Dieu Grace Healthcare. She joined us from Windsor, Ontario. Paul Burns, President, CEO, Canadian Gaming Association. And Deirdre Querney, registered social worker with the City of Hamilton's Alcohol, Drug and Gambling Services. Great to have all four of you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ontario's capital city was a very different place in 1894, but if you think it was staid or homogenous and bland, Carolyn Weitzman's new book tells a tale that might challenge that assumption. It is a real whodunit. It's called Clara at the Door with a Revolver, the scandalous black suspect, the exemplary white son, and the murder that shocked Toronto. And it brings Carolyn Weitzman back to our studio. Great to see you again. Lovely to see you. Let's just hit this on the top. This is a true story. It is. It, it's way too strange to be fiction. Well, <laughs> I was going to say, it's way too strange to be believable, but it actually happened. It actually happened, and I'm interested to hear what you think is the most strange aspect of the book. Well, I, I, I mean, I almost don't know where to begin. There's 10 different things that could answer that question, but let's start with this. How did you find this story to begin with? 
Okay, so 20 years ago when I was doing my PhD, which was on housing policy in uh, Parkdale, I was looking for examples of people living close by to one another who weren't of the same class, the same background. And I came across a story written in the 1960s about a woman who had been accused of killing her former neighbor, a black woman, an impoverished woman, a woman who occasionally wore men's clothes, uh, was accused of killing a rich white young man. And I became interested partly for the social history of it and started reading all the newspapers. And then I became quite passionately interested in Clara herself, the accused woman herself. Mm -hmm. Had no one told this story before? You see it every few years in the Toronto Star. There was a story in the Toronto Star last year, and I got very upset and wrote them a note. Um, and upset you, about what? Uh, upset that uh, the same lies have been repeated for 125 years. You see it occasionally on websites. There is one plaque in Toronto. I saw it yesterday in front of the Adelaide Street York House uh, Courthouse that mentions um, the uh, infamous acquittal of Clara Ford. You say you got sort of upset with the star because they have repeated the same lies that have been told numerous times over the years. Yeah. What are the, what, like for what example? Clara has been treated as an eccentric or possibly insane woman who uh, had a very good lawyer uh, and thus got away with murder. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my contention based on uh, the um, uh, contemporary reporting and which also had her testimony almost verbatim and she was the first uh, woman, second person, to testify on her own behalf, uh, that she was eminently sane, she was very smart, she was a performer, she was a uh, person who knew how to use humor to get people on side, that she saved herself and that she um, was not, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, going around shooting people because she was an angry black woman or because she uh, was prone to violence. Okay, um, but, but is it fair to say if it's 1894 in Toronto and you're yeah. a black woman dressing up as a man yeah. and a lesbian, that makes you a bit unusual? She certainly uh, got the attention of the police uh, because of those <laughs> factors. What was life like in the 1890s in this city for black people? Mm. So in, the, in 1861, when Clara was born, a lot of American refugees had come up from the United States because before the Civil War, there was something called the Fugitive Slave Act, which made people like the person I say is Clara's father come from Illinois, where he was a free man, but ran the risk of being kidnapped. So um, Toronto in 1861 had about 500 black people living in what was then a fairly small city and actually having some influence in political affairs. But by the 1890s, when Clara was on trial, it was again um, uh, 5,000 black people within what was now a city of 250,000 instead of, say, 80,000. And um, it was a completely different atmosphere for black people. Canada had prided itself on being a temporary haven for those refugees in the years before the Civil War. But by the 1890s, um, they were seen still as outsiders, as not real Canadians, etc. So actually, attitudes had harshened towards black people in uh, Toronto and in Canada by the late 19th century. Mind you, we've had other people on this program during Black History Month who have said there's a reason why the Underground Railroad terminus, one of them was in Toronto, because relatively speaking, given the times, Toronto was a pretty good place to be black in North America. That's what I've been told by black historians. Yeah, and and um, as I say, things change over time and some things get worse instead of better. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely, uh, William Lyon Mackenzie said in uh, the 1830s... That's the first mayor of Toronto. The first mayor of Toronto, absolutely. I should have explained that. Uh, and the uh, grandfather of William Lyon Mackenzie King. He said that um, in Toronto, black people can have white people as servants. and And that was... True, there is at least one case of a barber who had um, white people working for him. But at the same time, when William Lyon Mackenzie uh, said that, black people were, could still technically 
be slaves. It was before 1834, before the British uh, Empire abolished slavery. So it was, it was equivocal. Okay, we know who Clara Ford is, you've yeah. told us. Let's find out about the victim. This yeah. is Frank Westwood, mm -hmm. who was killed. 18-year-old mm -hmm. kid, mm -hmm. and what do we know about him? Well, at that time, he would have been considered a young adult. He'd just graduated from Parkdale High School, which still exists, and he had just started work downtown. He was the son of a wealthy industrialist who made boats and boat uh, accessories, and they lived by the shore on Lake Ontario, where the Gardner Expressway is now, but then it was a place that had, they had their own boathouse, and they were very, uh, Frank was very interested in boats. He was um, uh, a young, good-looking uh, man, and when he was shot, one of the first thoughts was, cherchez la femme, or there must be a girl in it. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the most plausible theory, which connects Ford and Westwood. Mm -hmm. What is it? So the most plausible theory is that Frank had tried to sexually assault or had sexually assaulted uh, Clara. When Clara confessed, and Clara did confess when she was arrested by the police, she said that Frank had assaulted her in Parkdale during the summer and that she had returned in October, October 6th, uh, in order to exact revenge on Frank. Um, she later retracted her confession. She said she'd been forced into a false confession by the police. Do you have any evidence that you've uncovered that suggests Yes, in fact, she was coerced to make that confession. Well, let's put it this way. I argue in the book that she was treated in a way that a white woman wouldn't have been treated at that time. At that time, the police would arrest you. They might ask you a few questions, but essentially they'd put you in jail the very next day you'd appear before the magistrate. What happened with Clara was that the police first started questioning her at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and it was 11 or 11.30 when she gave the confession, she wasn't given the opportunity to bring in a friend. It wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to bring in a lawyer in those days unless you could pay for one, but she didn't have the opportunity to bring in a friend or family member. Uh, the police were very excited uh, when Clara came up. This was six weeks after the murder, and they were being mocked for not having a, a suspect, and they were doing everything they could to create an airtight case, including a confession, and they, they went too far. Do you want to describe some of the details around the murder? He was shot uh, at the, his front door on a Saturday night after he'd been out with some friends. His um, mother was home waiting for him. They spoke for a brief period of time, then they turned off the light. Then um, Frank went downstairs. His mother didn't hear the doorbell ring, but she assumed that the doorbell had rung. He opened the door, she heard a shot, she ran downstairs. Um, Frank lived for a short period after being shot. He said that he'd been shot by a middle-aged, heavy-set man wearing a dark overcoat, wearing a fedora with a mustache. Um, almost immediately, um, the attention um, was paid to uh, Gus Clark, who uh, had been Frank's next door neighbor, and who was, and again, you couldn't make it up, he was a vibrator salesman by day and a burglar by night. Uh, he'd been in jail a couple of times. He was a few years older than Frank. He was 23. Did he have a motive for killing Frank? Yes, he had um, been shot at by uh, Frank's father, Benjamin Westwood, um, several weeks earlier in an incident over a theft at the boathouse. Now, once, what, what led the police to Clara when obviously Westwood thought we got somebody dead to rights here, and mm -hmm. he's identified this other guy. Gus was a very fishy uh, fellow, and um, Gus didn't directly speak to the police, but he did speak to a reporter when he was somewhat in his cups. He was somewhat drunk, and he said, I don't know why the police are paying any attention to me. There used to be a woman who lived with her mother and two children in the back of our house, and she had two revolvers, and uh, sometimes dressed in men's clothes, and um, uh, really didn't like uh, Frank. Uh, and then the police went, mm-hmm. And they turned their attention to Clara. Here's uh, how you describe it in the book. You write, Clara was characterized by the media as a monster. And this is an excerpt now from an article in the Globe and Mail. No, excuse me, it wasn't the Globe and Mail yet, it was just the Mail, right? 
Yes. I think so. Yes. I think that's right. Uh, here we go. She currently is reported by the Parkdale children to drink a quart of warm blood every morning, going around heavily armed on all occasions with the strength of any two or three men. Why was she characterized thus? There were seven newspapers in Toronto at the time, and they were engaged in a furious circulation war. So uh, in many cases, as I show in the book, they took a story. For instance, Clara being harassed in the streetcar, getting off with two people who had been, two men who had been harassing her, and either slapping or hitting one. And the next day, it was like Clara is known to possess the strength of two men. And the day after that, it would be Clara is a professional boxer. Uh, so. Um, um, the newspapers were all trying to win this circulation war and using fantastical stories about Clara in order to win that circulation war. Shall we show a picture here? Sheldon, you want to bring this up here? Let's take a look at this picture. Kellen, if you'd look over at the yeah. wall there. Okay, these are supposedly, and for those listening on podcast and can't see it, these are two sort of cartoons allegedly depicting Clara Ford. They, they kind of, I don't know, I guess... You want to describe what the significance of these two images is? Well, the, um, the part of the newspaper uh, 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 journalism was that they would take sketches, and these are two sketches that are taken of the same woman at the same time. Um, the they woman at the left uh, can only be described as um, mannish, heavy brow, um, uh, and the woman at the right can only be described as looking much younger and much more feminine. So it really depended on whether you were going to be selling newspapers on the basis that Clara Ford is an innocent victim railroaded by the police, or whether you're going to be selling newspapers um, saying that Clara is a monster, is a homosexual, is a um, person who doesn't even need a motive, because um, why should mad people have motives? Hmm. Do I remember this correctly? Maybe I don't. You're going to help me out here. Is this the first time the word homosexual has been used in the popular press in Toronto history? Well, I looked in a whole bunch of North American newspapers to check that out, and it does appear to be the first use of the term homosexual. So uh, a, a book by Kraft um, uh, Ebing had just been published in 1893, you, just translated using the term homosexual. Uh, Clara was being described actually as a, um, what would now be called transgendered, but um, uh, in other words, uncomfortable within her female body, um, more closely identifying with being a man. However, um, the journalist Hector Charlesworth, whose account of the trial became the basis of a lot of the lies told about Clara, um, was using the term homosexual to uh, describe Clara, and indeed I haven't found an earlier mention in any North American newspaper. What was the court like during her trial? Well, packed, first of <laughs> all. Uh, uh, smelly. Apparently the courtroom was uh, infamous for being smelly. Uh, but there were, by the time of her trial, which was in May of 19, uh, 1895, uh, there was a solid group of people who felt that uh, Clara was being railroaded by the police. Um, sentiment against the police was quite high at the time. So uh, there were a bunch of people who were uh, very passionately wanting to see her convicted. The assumption was that she would be convicted, but there were also some people who were on her side. The trial lasted four days, which sounds like a very short period of time, but quite often cases, including capital cases where there could be someone hanged at the end, were decided in a day. And Clara became, as I say, the first person to testify on her own behalf. And she testified for three and a half hours, and you could hear a pin drop during her testimony. Where was the trial heard? The trial was heard in Adelaide Street Courthouse. I was looking at the outside again today. It still exists. And um, it was, uh, uh, there were a whole bunch of um, uh, tables in the front and people frantically sketching Clara for this historic event. And um, a bunch of spectators in the back crowding for a spot. And what is the Adelaide Court House today? It is a fancy Italian restaurant. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, she have a lawyer? She had two lawyers. She had the lawyer that she picked up when, uh, during her preliminary hearing, who was a fellow named William Murdoch, but he's not the William Murdoch from the Murdoch Mysteries. I want to make that perfectly clear. <laughs> okay. And he was sort of a journeyman lawyer. And then she had a lawyer who was much better known, named EFB um, uh, Black. 
uh, Johnson, uh, and uh, he was generally credited with his uh, with her acquittal. So he did a good job. He did a good job. She did a good job. She did a good job. Yeah, her testimony. Yeah. Was how significant uh, related to the verdict? I think that it completely swung the jury. Now, there was this story that I tell about the trial where the police brought in someone who was very clearly perjuring herself to say that Clara was a prostitute and that Frank had picked her up as a prostitute. Um, however, when she questioned, uh, she immediately said, no, the police said that they'd um, uh, not prosecute me for a prostitution conviction if I did this testimony. So there was, everybody is lying in this book. That's one thing you need <laughs> to know. Um, but uh, even besides the sort of own goal that the police had in that particular uh, piece of testimony, Clara was able to describe the scene of her arrest and her questioning in a way that preyed on a whole bunch of assumptions about how men should treat women and how police officers should treat suspects that she very cleverly used. She describes being literally sort of pushed into a corner, first in her little room in the rooming house that she lived, then uh, within the police headquarters. She uh, said that um, she was told that if she said that she murdered Frank in self-defense because he had tried to assault her, that not only would she never be convicted, but also that she could get a $500 reward offered by the Ontario government. Mm. And keeping in mind that the jury, who of course were white men, but they also were working class men, uh, both from Toronto and from areas outside Toronto, such as Markham, that were more agricultural at that time, some of them had had bad run-ins with the police. Mm. And some of them perhaps uh, very much sympathized with this notion of this person going about her business. She was a hard worker and being called in by the police and being pushed into a false confession. So she, she, she gave the performance of her life. Hmm. This case was clearly a big deal back in the day. Mm -hmm. Question is, how, how influential do you think it was in terms of dealing with or answering some of the big, bigger ethical questions around the justice system at the time? Well, Clara's case was being brought up even to the 1940s um, around issues of how the police should try to push for confessions or not. But um, it has to be said that Clara disappears from Toronto not long after the trial. She actually joined the first uh, black vaudeville troupe as a dancer. Uh, and. Um, I think the old prejudices of Toronto and some of the hypocrisies of Toronto continued on. How did Toronto react after she was acquitted? Well, immediately afterwards, the crowd uh, in the courtroom cheered. She was accompanied back the four blocks from Adelaide and Church to Adelaide and York Street, where she lived in the uh, slum then known as the Ward. Uh, there was a party in the restaurant at the base of her uh, boarding house. Uh, and um, then, you know, the newspapers, the newspapers who were on her side said, this is a just verdict. And the newspapers who very much were not on her side said, this is a low point for Canadian jurisprudence <laughs> and uh, life sort of went on. I don't think that she made huge radical changes. Having said that, the thing that fascinates me about Clara is that we don't know that much about the lives of low-income women, certainly of black women, and because seven newspapers were so obsessed with Clara, we know where she lived, we know who she worked for, we even know what she ate, you know, um, the um, blood that she perhaps drank. Well, her <laughs> mother was Scottish, maybe she was making blood pudding, I don't know, you know, so um, I think that it's a great opportunity to get a view of Toronto that maybe um, gives a slightly different view from the way that we generally think of Toronto in the 19th century. Why do you think uh, journalists and historians have got so many of the facts screwed up over the years? Well, I, I guess it's two things. One is this um, uh, journalist, Hector Charlesworth, who in his memoirs said that he sometimes made up fakes, fake news, hmm. but sometimes it was true. Uh, that is the main account of the case by someone who was actually there. And also because I think that it has taken until now for us to give 
credence to a woman who, like, was her wearing men's clothes eccentric or was it a legitimate way, as she said herself, to feel safer, mm -hmm. to have access to jobs that she otherwise wouldn't have had? I think that Clara, in a way, um, was waiting for a day like today day to sort of come into her own as a character who was perhaps a little bit ahead of her time. And of course, there's so many resonances today with controversies about the police, with controversies around believing a woman when she says that she's been sexually assaulted, um, around um, the, the labels that get put on a single mother, because Clara was a single mother. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, Clara's time is today. Just finally, where's yeah. she buried? Oh, I wish I knew. I'm actually going to go after this taping and see where Frank Westwood is buried. But um, uh, Clara disappeared soon after the trial. I haven't been able to find out what happened to her or to her daughters. But I hope that she has descendants somewhere and maybe one will show up. Frank Westwood, I think, is about a 20-minute walk that way, isn't That's he? That's why I'm going afterwards. <laughs> okay. I got it. You're he's welcome in, to join me. He's in Mount Pleasant Cemetery, he's isn't in he? Mount Pleasant yeah. Cemetery, okay. yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, that's a gr that, that's a great title. Did you come up with the title? No. Uh, that's, <laughs> kudos to <laughs> my whoever wonderful came. publisher, Melissa Pitts, UBC Press. She's done that twice. She's she's taken a look at a book and she's gone. I've got a killer title for this book. <laughs> no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> Clara at the door with a revolver. The scandalous black suspect, the exemplary white son, and the murder that shocked Toronto. Carolyn Weitzman. Thanks for coming back to TVO. Thank you, Steve. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. Amid a shifting international order, as the human rights regime put in place in the post-World War II era lost its mooring. We'll explore that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Looking for more of TVO Today's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash newsletters to sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, read Steve Pakin's articles, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash newsletters.